Morning guys, um, like Sean said, we have been receiving questions from guys all over the country. Um, we're going to probably have even more, so we'll be having more of these Q&A things as we go along. But let's get into the ones that we have actually received up to now. One that keeps recurring and one that keeps causing a bit of headache, may we as qualified plumbers install instantaneous gas geysers. Uh, they're being sold all over, they're being used all over. The question to, or the answer to that question is no, unless you can provide or unless you can comply with the following requirements. The unit that you're installing needs to be a, uh, a unit that complies with SANS 180824. Don't mind the SABs approved, uh, that was actually supposed to be tested to a SANS standard. And it's marked for its intended use because you get ones that work inside, you get ones that need to be fluid to the outside, you get ones that can only work inside. And the size of the unit, be it instantaneous or storage, because you do get storage type gas geysers, and the net power rating is calculated as per the document uh, that we use for water installations. Part of the installation complies with uh, 10252 2012, 10.254 and 10, 10, 6 and 13 which all required balance pressure. All of those documents require your water or your hot and cold water to be within 20 percent of, um, oh sorry, should, you should be able to install these lines without more than 20 percent drop on the um, hot water or on the water supply. I'll, cal I'll show you the calculations now. The installation of the gas is done by LPGA accredited installer that is uh, there's no negotiations around that. If we look at the, the requirement from the standard says, in most cases, the instantaneous water heating process is triggered by a differential pressure switch and an orifice restrictor. This causes higher downstream hot water flow pressure drops than normal storage water heaters. Therefore, pipe design, pipe sizing and simultaneous use of terminal fittings shall be carefully considered and calculated to ensure hot water and balanced, or su sorry, sufficient hot water and balanced hot and cold water pressure at terminal fittings. I can tell you from experience, I've had, I've had meetings with about four or five um, wet services engineers, and I'm yet to see an approved rational design around pipe sizing and simultaneous use. And this is the 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 tripping stone, or the this is the trap that everybody can't seem to get past. The various components of the system shall be so installed that the hot and cold water delivery pressure to these mixing components are balanced. The residual dynamic pressure at the fitting shall not vary by more than 20%. This requires that the layout and the pipe sizes shall be correctly calculated in terms of 10252.1. So if we have a look at that formula, I know this is this is not something that plumbers look forward to, but these formulas are all available in 10252.1. So it's very simple. You take the literage of hot times the temperature of the hot, add the cold, and you divide by the volume, and you'll get your temperature mix. So if we have 10 liters per minute at 38 degrees, you'll see that the math work out quite nicely. You have 5 liters at 60, and you have 5 at 16, and you end up getting your 38 degrees. Notice that we do have uh, 5 and 5, which gives you a pretty nice balance. And then all you need to look at is if you go to do the same math and you take 20% off the cold water because it wasn't sized correctly or it was drawn off at an inappropriate place on that supply line and you change the, the, the numbers, then all of a sudden you get to a totally different result. When we look at this and we look at 41, is a warm bath, so it's something that you can that you can be comfortable in. 42, you start getting to very hot, and at 49, you start looking at first degree burns in four minutes. So the numbers might seem insignificant, but if you're looking at um, elderly people 
or you're looking at children or you're looking at someone that's got uh, skin issues two or three degrees makes a huge difference in as far as your your actual water delivery is concerned when you're looking at unbalanced pressure you're looking at temperature shocks in other words you need to start fiddling with taps or there's a sudden burst of cold water you open the hot water these things are are, are, are very dangerous when it comes to especially older people but other than that, if we look at the plain common sense behind it, if you're going to stand around in a shower battling for three minutes to uh, set your water temperature, bearing in mind that with the water restrictions and the, the scarcity and the, the probably getting more scarce of water, um, you'll find that there's a whole lot of water being wasted because you can't get to a comfortable temperature to shower. Second question that keeps popping up here. A plan submitted to a local authority gets approved. May a plumber deviate from such an approved plan? Very important. We run into this all the time and we get questions all the time. And then the plumber says, but, you know, the plan wasn't correct or there was an issue. The straight up answer is no. These approved plans are legal documents and you do not deviate from them. If there's an issue on them, if you see a problem in complying, consult your drainage slash building uh, control um, in that area speak to the client speak to the uh, designer show out where the problems are try and get them resolved before you actually get caught up into fixing something or changing something that firstly wasn't agreed upon because these plans get signed by the designer and the owner as being correct or as being acceptable to both of them before it gets submitted to council so by unilaterally just going along and changing it and making your life easier or you know rectifying a mistake that you saw that wasn't sorted out with the local authority or the designers beforehand will definitely turn out to be a problem for the guys that attended the 10 to 5 2 part 1 session you'll recall this it says here preliminary information needed by the designer so you'll find that the designer is then sorry just want to get my hand out here there we go the designer and before that project gets approved or before that whole installation gets done, you'll find that having gone through site plan, purpose of the building, points, water points, types of fixtures, schedule of fittings, quantity of water, nature of the subsoil, water obtainable from the main, you might actually require more than what the main can supply, which becomes a bit of a problem. Static and where possible residual pressures water quantities and flow rates obtainable from a water supply and where applicable a schedule of acceptable pipes and fittings we can't just go and stick anything that we need in there requirements for drawings and other information that has to be submitted for obtaining approval special precautions details of existing connections and services we can't just go cutting across a site there might be servitudes with municipal services there might be cables there might be um, nowadays you see pavements being dug up all over the place for um, fiber optic cables last thing you want to do is get involved in a legal battle or in an insurance claim as far as to someone breaking a service once you've gone through what is that part M that's 13, 14 you're looking at about 15 or 16 points that they need to check before the plan gets approved I'm sure you'll agree that it would be very risky to just go along and uh, work on a drawing or change a drawing without consulting with whoever was responsible to deal with that issue from the word go. Testing of drains, it's something that um, I know um, uh, PRP is working on. At the moment there is a category for underground drainage. Getting an open trench or getting a drain tested is a bit of an issue because by the time your drain is being laid and backfilled, you haven't filled in the COC. So there's work being done to include that in the rest of the checking process. But other than that, as far as testing and drains are concerned, national building regulations, in other words, the document that the building control uses to govern work done in the area, um, clearly states or clearly indicates to them that the any drain, discharge pipe or vent pipe shall be installed as to be capable with the standing 426 and 427 contained in SANS 10 founder part B which is the application of the building regulations and such tests shall be carried out in the presence of the building control officer. So 
even if they do not have plumbing and drainage inspectors per se, your building, the local building control officer may still require you to actually then do the test as per PP 26 and 27 in his presence and he'll see that you've passed or he'll see that uh, the results of your test and accordingly or sign off your building accordingly. Any equipment, material or labor required for that inspection and test shall be provided by the plumber. Uh, no person shall put into use any drainage installation before that installation has been inspected, tested and passed, take note, and passed by the local authority as compliant. And then any person who contravenes a sub, or the requirements of sub-regulation 3, in other words, you move into a house without having your drainage checked and signed, shall be guilty of an offense. Now, for the guys that have attended the last couple of months' worth of, of webinars, when it comes to uh, acts or when it comes to the building regulations, which is an act for the NBR, you'll find that most of the, the actual requirements end up that if you contravene any of these, you shall be guilty of an offense. So you won't get taken to task or you won't get drawn into a uh, court by simply... Um, saying that, uh, you know, we're waiting for you to hear your call, they'll, they'll slam the whole book or they'll throw the whole book at you to make sure that they claim or they quote every single act that applies to that specific installation or that transgression and they won't start, they'll go 10 for under part P but from P they'll jump straight back to the act because it's easier if, it, if uh, the act has been gazetted that's where the legal responsibility starts and the application of that is what the building inspectors do. So we look at a normal barrel test with a torch and a mirror and then you start, you could do an air test or you could do a uh, water test which no one does nowadays because of the scarcity of water. And then if we go to the actual design of the building, you'll see that the guys go along and they'll tell you very quickly when it comes to requirements of subregulation one which is all of the access and the loads and the number of fixtures all of the the design criteria that we dealt with to start off with uh, will be satisfied when that installation complies with 10 400 part b provided that where the local authorities of the opinion that the size and the complexity of that installation in any building renders it essential for it to become a uh, subject of a rational design which means that that person that then quotes or that then deals with that design or that did the design originally would then be the, the one to actually have to answer and come up with a signature or a form 4 to say that they've, they're happy with their design and it works and it was installed according to their design. So those are the first two questions that keep or that kept on cropping up as we went along. Um, I'm sure we'll get plenty more of these to deal with. Is there, if there's any uncertainty or there's any issues with regards to what we discussed this morning, have we got any questions, Sean? Right, so we do have a question here. It says, recently the PRB has stated that any jobs over 1,000 Rand require a COC. Does this include jobs such as unblocking a drain or such activities? What, or that you don't actually work with components within the system? Um, okay, the I think the amount is actually 1,500 then. Uh, but yeah, the, I don't think the, the maintenance aspect, when we're talking about installations or work done, you're, if you're going to be unblocking a drain, unless you've actually physically replaced a section of that drain or you've done work on that installation, I don't think you have to issue a COC for a block drain because I've worked on block drains for two or three days and then you'll find that by the time you've cleared a, a 250 or 300 main and the thing actually runs after three days and you have to book a COC for that, I don't think that was the, the actual intent. I think it's more installation and if you've altered or like in uh, the building regulation says if you install or alter or physically work on that drain or change it by adding a branch into it or something like that, I think that would be more applicable than actually just doing the, the, the maintenance on it. 
Right, perfect. The next question reads, do I issue a COC on a temporary structure that needs a sewer connected and water and plumbing was done by another contractor? When you're saying temporary structure, are we talking temporary like in set up site office for a construction site where they have a toilet ablution facility um, for the people working on that site? No, because by the time that CO or you, you issue the COC at the end of the project, then by the time that COC might get audited, you'll probably find that that temporary structure has already been removed. So if it's temporary in the sense of that shorter space or that shorter space of time for as far as temporary is concerned, I don't think that's necessary. Um, if it's going to be, when you say temporary, like a maybe a, uh, uh, one of these informal or these sports fields where they have like an ablution and the thing is going to be there for quite a bit, I would say yes, you need to do that. Um, so I'm not 100% sure what the, 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 the temporary bit is about. But if it's, if, like I say, if it's only toilets for uh, uh, a site, cons uh, what, what would you call it, site uh, prep or getting a site ready for for people to work on it, then no, because by the time that COC is issued, uh, the site will be cleaned up already. All right, we have got a comment here. It reads, in a tech talk a couple of weeks ago, it was mentioned by law, uh, you only have to issue a PRB COC on work carried out on a HWC. That is 100% correct. Um, 10254 for the for the normal uh, uh, fixed water heaters, uh, 1352 heat pump and 1010 It is um, an installation requirement that upon completion you need to do a COC. The, the flip side of the coin is that when you join PRB um, and you do that whole process, then the for the 1500 and or I, th I think it's always been 1500, could have been a thousand that went to 1500. The amount is not uh, uh, the issue. There are requirements as far as being a member. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's more of a moral obligation. You won't find um, the drainage standard saying that you have to issue a COC. But what I can tell you is, and it's happened in the last couple of months, where Steve Brown and um, Martin Kashula and Lorraine and them got stuck in his, uh, Steve Jones and them, they got stuck in his London. All that happened was the building control officer walked onto site, the place was all paved, cement closed up, all the rest of that sorted. And then he came back and he said, okay, you would like to see a COC for that uh, installation because he's never checked it. And that COC document is intended to have the plumber self certify the work. So if he's not seen it or he hasn't had the opportunity to test it, he would like a COC issued. In that case, you will probably find that in the interest of your client or getting the job signed off, if you've done the job yourself and you're 100% sure that this thing is, is, is according to spec, you might find that you'll have to sign a COC to get the building control to sign off your building. But that's like a, an isolated case. There are sections of the building regulations where you do not, by law, have to issue a COC, but as a member, you're obligated to stick to the 1500 or 1500 rand rule. And if you do work on a drain and you take ownership of what you've done, you can still issue that COC. I hope that answers that question. All right, perfect. Well, we do not have any questions um, remaining for this morning. Uh, would you like to end off, Munir? 100%. Thanks, guys, for, for putting uh, or, or sharing your morning coffee with us. And we'll see each other next week, Thursday again. Enjoy your day. Perfect. Thanks so much, guys, for joining us. Please remember on the way out, there is a survey within the... Um, or the survey that opens up within the web browser afterwards. Uh, that you can go ahead and answer for us. Um, but Munir, just before we do hand off, uh, another question has come up. It reads, okay. where sewer pipes are installed? Inside cavities, in double stories, in the states, and on every no access point to unblock sewers. What does the law say? Yeah. Um, well, obviously that installation is non-compliant. 
Um, there's about five or six different references in the drainage standard on uh, in 10252 part 1 and 10400 part P for that matter that albeit a stack that uh, 110 mil stack on the wall or a 40 or 50 mil uh, waste pipe connecting to that stack every change of direction uh, let me just get back here quickly every change of direction there we go uh, P2 part of the building regulations we're looking at any necessary may be performed through means cleaning and maintenance through means of access provided so if you're saying that there's no access to these uh, stacks or to these uh, uh, wastes then obviously it's not a compliant uh, installation um, if you have to start opening up and amending it then obviously you'll have to issue a COC for that but if a whole complex is done like that you might have some some or you might have a lot of work on your hands but the fact is that there's three or four different documents that state you need to be able to maintain a waste pipe or a stack without demolishing a part of the building or without uh, pulling the whole building down so obviously the first installation wasn't compliant and if you are going to be making it compliant I would start by checking whether the building was actually signed off by the PCO or whether these people have just moved in there prior to the whole thing being checked or legalized but yeah it's a it's a it's a common occurrence and I can tell you it is probably going to be enforced more and more because as we get to people working on standards for uh, gray water or for water being um, recycled if you can't even access it to put a spring in it or to open up a block drain how can you collect water to be recycled or reclaimed so yeah um, I'm not sure where this case is maybe start with your building control and see if you can't get to the bottom of who did the original installation but yeah you definitely need access if it's in the cavity it's already a problem if there's no access there's a second problem and if you have to start demolishing each of those units to get to the waste pipe every time something blocks then obviously that's going to be even worse hope that answers that well, it's another one has come through um, okay. it reads if I house has two geezers then I install another one to make it then I discover that one of the old geezers has no COC if I'm issuing COCs on the house should I charge for each COC or I issue three at a price of one okay um, let's start with a with a with a, the fact that the, it's got two um, existing geezers then fitting a third one that third one strictly speaking after 2011 um, should not be a normal uh, fixed electric water heater they should either be a solar or a heat pump or some alternate source connected to it because you after 2011 you're not supposed to connect uh, just straightforward electrical geezers the other two that's in there you could possibly note them uh, depending on what they look like I mean if they are horrific and there's a safety issue or two you could actually note that as a non-compliance on your COC but issuing a COC for all three of them would be very risky because you're not sure what happened with the installation of the original two if they are compliant and someone else has done them and you're willing to take that risk which I advise you not um, I would simply state that the your your COC is for the one that you've done because that's all that PRB COC says it work done by myself work done by uh, uh, under my supervision so if you didn't do the other two I wouldn't worry about it all right so another one has come up it reads how do we determine the size of a geezer for the dwelling uh, the short and sweet answer if it's a normal residential single like a, a dwelling on a property um, we have got uh, I think it's part A in the building regulations you have uh, the amount of bedrooms there's two people per bedroom and the current table 5 in 10252 part 1 says you need between 40 and 50 liters per person per day as far as storage is concerned so you're looking at roughly about 100 liters per bedroom although when it comes to solar there's some other fractions that you need to add and you did it's a, it's a bit more complicated than that but if you're running at 100 liters per bedroom you can't be too far off the mark 
Right, I think we have got time for one now. It reads, what type of pipe can be used to supply a house with water on the surface where copper pipe may be stolen? Uh, okay, it's a, it's a, looking at either, depending on the finish, you could probably use it on a, or get it chased into the wall. The issue has always been that the, the, aftermarket value of copper makes it a an issue for it to get carried or to get chopped off during the night or in the absence of someone in the house the issue that we do have is that that not there's not a single plastic pipe that has been tested to a national standard and if you bear in mind and, and, and guys tend to forget this that if you if you 15874 the polybutylenes all the, the 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 plastic type pipes most of those pipes are actually all uh, they had ISO standards, um, which had the the SABS have adopted. So it's, uh, all of them say that you can only use a plastic pipe inside a building. So unless you can cover it or you can box it or you can clean it up in a way that there's no plastic exposed to UV, then only copper can be used outside. If it's a new build, I'll go straight to the inside of the building and chase it on the inside skin get it into the ceiling, do the distribution on the inside, but I know it's difficult when it comes to existing dwellings and pipe work on the outside of the building. All right, well, guys, it has gone 7.30. I do have to go ahead and end off the session. Uh, we, there are still a couple of questions here, so we will get those to you via email, um, and then we can answer them there. But other than that, guys, thanks so much for joining us again. Thank you, um, Adrian, for taking the time out to prepare, and also for um, jumping in when we needed you. No Everything problem. else, guys, um, I will go ahead and end off the session now. Thanks so much again, and enjoy the rest of your week. Okay. Bye, guys.